Hello, this is Arlene Sanchez Walsh, Professor of Religious Studies at Azusa Pacific University. I'm your guest host on the Classical Ideas podcast. We're continuing to highlight Latinx religions, and I am happy, I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Lloyd Barba, who is an assistant professor of religion and core faculty in Latinx and Latin American studies at Amherst College, no slouch. Hi, Lloyd, it's been a long time, good to see you. Arlene, so good to see you. Happy to chat with you about the book. Yeah, thanks for joining me to talk about this book. Go get it. Go buy it. It is sold out, if you can imagine that. An academic book that about 400 people know about or who can really actually say that they're experts, which is amazing. Let me tell you what it is. Go back order, and you can always do the digital download, people. Go ahead and do it. It's called Sewing the Sacred Mexican Pentecostal Farm Workers in California published by Oxford University Press. So let's get to it. All right, so first off, I love this. You're a fan of alliteration, I can tell. I wonder if that's maybe your background, I'm not sure. If literature, if you fell in love with literature when you were a kid. But this is how you, how you described your folks, or the folks that you study in this book. Submerged schismatic substratum, fantastic. And you do that a few other times in your book when you kind of alliterate to kind of use very descriptive language. Uh, tell us about this group of people. Why did you want to write about them? Thanks, Arlene, for the question. Um, well, first of all, I do like alliteration, as you can tell from Sewing the Sacred. I wasn't going to go as far as to say, you know, Christian campesinos in California, but could have gone in that direction, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the start of the book, uh, the topic, um, I'll start off by just... Uh, I guess taking the question uh, like yeah. a true historian where I consider yeah. the question of origins and like a true religious studies professor, I think about myth and origins. So I think somewhere in between the liminal space there um, is the best answer. Okay. But I'll tackle in a couple of directions. So maybe origins, uh, as far as the writing goes, it started with the senior uh, thesis capstone seminar at the University of the Pacific. So for one, I was already deeply captivated by California history, having taken a course on the topic in my sophomore year. And that's around the time I also declared the religious studies major. And in writing uh, work on religion in California, I came across Lori Maffley Kipp's uh, first book on uh, uh, frontier religion in California. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, I read that excellent. too. I read that too when I was in, geez, I don't remember when I first read it, but boy, that that it does send you on that trajectory somehow, right? You just go, oh, I, I need to do this, or I need to do something like it. Right. Right. Exactly. And think of all these full circles. Uh, Lori Maffley Kip was uh, she did her B.A. here at Amherst College. So all these oh, nice. connections here and there. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. So um, uh, in that senior seminar is also um, that was led by uh, Bill Swaggerty. He's a historian of the American West, and he really encouraged us to do local history. Okay. And uh, in some ways, that paper, that senior capstone seminar, that's what uh, basically was the origins of the book. Okay. Um, but right. if we're going to think about the, oh, if you wanted me to comment on the myth, the oh, origins, go ahead. I can kind of you talk know what? about that's, that too. That's your thing. That's your jam, as the kids say. So <laughs> I may tune out. I may just go check my phone. No, I'm just joking. But please <laughs> tell us, tell us. Yeah. So um, having grown up uh, Latino Catholic in the Latino Catholic context, and again, don't let the name Lloyd uh, fool you, um, and later <laughs> being part of a uh, of, later being part of a majority white Pentecostal denomination, the dynamics, the racial dynamics. In, in both contexts, they always stood out to me. Yeah. I mean, no one grows up in Stockton without being conscious about race and class. It's all around you. It's in the area that you breathe in Stockton. So I was always quite mindful of that. Um, so again, writing that seminar paper, thinking about these different contexts, I came across your book, Arlene, uh, when I was doing research for it, your Latino Pentecostal identity book. And I also... Published 2003, yeah. Columbia yep. University Press, you know, because commercials are what make the world go round when it comes to <laughs> right. academia, Lloyd, right? So thank you so much for mentioning that. And you also quoted me in your book, you know, oh. and you put me, you put me right in front. If, if I, if, if I can tell people, right, there's another reason you need to buy this, right? Because there's, let's just say contentious ideas out there about who writes what first. It's a mm -hmm. kind of a stupid thing, <laughs> you know, because yeah. chronology is a social construct, as we know. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll throw my own mythos in there. Right. Right. Um, but it's interesting, right, that, that all these kind of confluence all comes to you as you're making your way through college and you're looking at the long road ahead going, wow, this is about 10 years of my life. Uh, but continue. 
Yeah. And so, again, uh, having read your book and I'm reading again in that last semester as an uh, as an undergrad, I see that there's a possibility to do this research. I also came across uh, articles by Dan Ramirez or Daniel Ramirez at the time. Another awesome um, person. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah wonderful mentor, a wonderful PhD advisor. And so uh, kind of really taking your cue, you did a uh, history and ethnographic work. Yeah. Um, I, I visited some Latino Pentecostal churches. The one I visited in particular was affiliated with the group that I study in the book, the Apostolic Assembly of the Faith in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I also visited a um, an African-American church. Uh, it was the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Yeah. And so, P -A -W. yeah, I mean, P -A -W, P -A -W. right? We're going to yeah. try and stay away from all of the, what are they called? Acronyms? Right. Right. Because that, that will just glaze people's eyes. Like, oh my God, there's so many. If we told you there's probably a thousand Pentecostal denominations and only about 10% of that has had any kind of research that will send all of the potential PhD folks running going, okay, which one has not been written on? Cause I'm going to do that one. Right. right. And you've done, you've done that with this book. Am I correct? This is the first time anybody has really done significant critical inquiry into and we'll shorten it just for our audience, the Apostolic Assembly. Right, because I mean, even in the context of Dan's book, which is much more of a binational project, he looks at the a counterpart in the in Mexico, the Iglesia Apostolica. And yeah. so he's much more of a broader kind of work on uh, Latino Pentecostalism. And so this one is focusing again on farm workers in California. And uh, if I may, I can just say in 30 seconds or so how I came across that particular project, Mexican sure. Pentecostal farm workers. You go. You up for it? Okay. Uh, so that kind of came together a bit more coherently in the summers of 2013 and 14. At the time, I was a PhD student in Michigan. Um, Dan Ramirez and I, we received generous funding from the University of Michigan to um, collect, uh, to organize these massive collections at Fuller Theological Seminary. And Arlene and I, massive is an understatement. At the end, the Manuel Gajola collection, the yeah. Manuel Viscada collection, they ended up being 211 boxes. See, that's a historian's dream, right? right. That's like, I, how am I going to do this work? This is so massive an undertaking. It's going to take me 20 years. I'll never get a job. I'll never get onto the world. And then suddenly, what is that called? Manna from heaven. These boxes fall into your lap, right? And with some hard work and cataloging and getting it done, am I correct? You yeah. put, you and Dan and others put that together. Daniel Ramirez. Yeah. Right, who's at, who's a, a associate professor of religion at Claremont, for those of you who are interested in expanding and looking at what we all do, right? right. Okay, so go, please continue. Oh, uh, just uh, wrapping it up here uh, for, this, for the first part of the, uh, the question. Um, so yeah, the Manuel, uh, the Manuel Viscata collection. So I say the name here uh, to also point uh, the audience to the man that's standing up on the far right on the cover of Sewing the Sacred, that's yeah. Manuel Viscata. Oh, That's wow. him right there. Started off wow, as a farm worker. Yeah. yeah, great. And he eventually became the presiding bishop with the highest elected position in the Apostolic Assembly in the U.S. Wow. So wow. no small player there by, no. by any stretch of the mind. Right, right. No, I get that. Okay, before we move on, uh, let's do a real quick take on the different type of group that you studied. Uh, the Apostolic Assembly mm -hmm. is different than what we normally call classical Pentecostal denominations, which uh, for those of you really into theology, are considered Trinitarian, right? And so when you call them submerged schismatic, you mm -hmm. kind of use it as a badge of honor. And I'm guessing that they do too. Schisma you, you use schismatic quite a lot. You use heterodox quite a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us the difference between the Trinitarian and the, the oneness groups that you studied and uh, why you felt comfortable using that terminology. Yeah, so uh, the main difference, I mean, that can be summarized quite quickly. Um, for one, uh, these oneness Pentecostals or apostolic Pentecostals, they reject the belief in the Trinity, which is like a classical sort of Christian doctrine, right? That's pretty fundamental. So to reject is. that is to reject a, a major component of uh, the shared faith for a lot of folks. Um, also, rather than baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when they baptize, they baptize in Jesus' name. And it is, I mean, it's the preeminent ritual to the extent that they ask folks to get rebaptized. That's not uncommon at all. That is amazing. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that in, in a couple of minutes. That that was stunning, just a stunning yeah. part of the book. And, uh, now, reading this as a historian, and I'm thinking about sources, oral histories, the photographs, this commemorative yearbook. And I don't know if I ever told you the story. And, and just so people know, we've known each other a long time. 
And we, we bonded over stories, right? And we bonded over sharing stories about growing up, about how we came to do this work, about like meeting people, right? So I may have told you the story. Uh, I, I think you know this person, her name was Stella Cantu. Mm-hmm. I believe she was the daughter of one of the big wigs in this movement, right? Benjamin, right. Benjamin Cantu. And uh, she pressed this book to her chest in 1997, because I was considering doing exactly what you just did, this book, okay? Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, nobody's done this. I'm going to think, of, I'm thinking about doing this, even though I have no background in this whatsoever. And I met her at a church. She 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 held this to her bosom, right? I'm sounding like the 19th century, but it really was incredible. <laughs> and she says, you have to understand, this is sacred to me. And even though I'm not in that church right now, my, it's my father's church, it's my legacy. So uh, I'm going to give it to you. You have to use it here and then you give it right back. And it took forever. It was literally prying it out of her hands. And I understood it. You know, as someone who does this work, we do ethnographic work. We work with people. We live with people. We we share their grief and their joys. I mean, we we do more than just sit back and take notes. Right. It's an amazing kind of process what we do. So tell us about that. Tell us about the process first, about how it what it took to recreate this history that you were working on. Yeah, I mean, goodness, Arlene, are you sure you weren't in a university library reading room under those circumstances? <laughs> no kidding. Oh. <laughs> no kidding. My white gloves. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So as far as getting the uh, materials goes, um, you know, so many of the materials that were, I would say, difficult to access, as you experienced, um, yeah. those were available to me uh, by virtue of doing the work in the archives. So the commemorative volume we're talking about and some of the other ones that I discuss in the book, mm-hmm. uh, there were so many extra copies and copies of copies oh. that as we're going through the material, Milka uh, Montanez Viscada, the daughter of mm-hmm. Manuel Viscada, who donated all the materials, she gave me a copy. And again, there was ample copies available. So that it was not hard to get those. But I did realize how treasured they were. Uh, folks had them like, you know, prominently placed right up on their bookshelves. And they were family heirlooms. Isn't that amazing, right? Because because you know mm-hmm. if you're invited into homes, right, and then you see the mantles, right? right, family pictures. If you're in a Catholic home, sometimes you'll see La Virgen. Sometimes you'll see the picture of Jesus. You'll see rosaries, maybe some can. You know that's where I was raised with all of that stuff ephemera are surrounding me, and so I'm wondering in a Protestant Pentecostal setting, it might be Bible verses, it might be the you know, but it might be that book. Mm-hmm. Right. It, Very well. that, that takes a, a that takes a center stage. Right. Because it, it's it's a commemoration of survival, I want to say. Right. right. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree with that? That it's like we made it. Right. Oh, yeah. Nobody thought we would make it, but we made it. <laughs> I think that's why Arlene, that's part of the reason I use some of these terms, as you mentioned, these yeah. uh, submerged schismatic. So that's right. That's right. Um, I mean, Walter Goldschmidt used the terms uh, to describe these Pentecostals in California's valleys that were so far off the mainstream, he kind of turned to these geological metaphors. Yeah, I think they work nicely. I use the term heterodox instead of the uh, more charged term heretical because right. I don't <laughs> use those. I don't use that kind of uh, evaluative language to begin of with. Of course, of course, yeah. But I think they recognize that they are, you know, outside of the mainstream of Christian thought. Just the rejection of the Trinity and rejection of baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So right. I mean, right, got it. Yeah, got there, it. there's compelling reasons to use the terms. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you uh, talk to your folks, and a lot of these are all histories you did on your own, right? Because I looked mm-hmm. at the index, yes. and you know, you've been working on this for a long time, mm-hmm. as most of us do. And you know, you're to be commended for that. Did you ever view them as co-authors? I mean, how do you treat that material as an oral historian? You know, which is that's part of see that's part of our work because we didn't have a lot of stuff written down, and mm-hmm. the stuff we have written down has not made it into the mainstream of American religious history. You know, mm-hmm. as it's written, as it's taught. I mean, what do you think about your quote unquote subjects? I mean, are they co-authors of your work? Where do they stand in relation to what you wrote? I mean, I, I could not have done the work without them. I mean, that's yeah. yeah, I mean that that's it's their stories that are the building blocks to this. So it's their right. stories, their oral histories, yeah. it's the photographs. And we often had that we had that refrain, right, in uh, Latino religion, Latinx religion, that we do our work in conjunto. Yes, and I yes. think that that's that's quite true, and I tried to maintain that as I did the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, the, the the sources I consulted, they weren't written by trained historians per se. Yeah, 
Right. And the Spanish that's using them is, you know, filled with flourishes and hagiography. So I try on the one hand to balance an appreciation of these sources while at the same time interrogating the claims sure. Um, sure. and the style. Arlene, I'll share with you directly from the book. Um, yeah, tell one me. of the most significant revelations that struck me as I was uh, reading the 1966 commemorative volume. So folks yep. know this one. It's a red book. Um, it's been translated more recently into English, but oh. that 66 commemorative volume, again, that's the heirloom, right? Yep. As I was reading that and the autobiography of the denomination's patriarch, Antonio Nava, I was struck by the extent to which uh, their telling of history mimicked the Acts of the Apostles in the, in the New Testament. And fortunately, I am conversant enough with the Bible to recognize biblical allusions when I see them. And Arlene, the amount in uh, uh, um, of these kind of retellings, appropriations in the in the early history of the apostolic history books was just jaw dropping. I mean, wow. the chroniclers clearly saw their history unfolding as a twenty first or as a, as a twentieth and then twenty first uh, century version of the Acts of the Apostles. Um, yeah. You can, again, you have these English translation that's translated, I believe, in 2014 or so. Okay. And so as a 21st century church, they're still kind of buying into that vision. So okay. this, this again, I saw so much. Um, yeah. I, I called it this kind of writing, the Acts of the Apostolicos. I know. I know. That, that, again, they bought into it. very interesting, interesting stuff. All right. Um, I'll ask you about American history in a bit, but I do want to get to the baptisms because that is essential to understanding this. As I understand it, Rebaptism is really uh, an outward sign of an inward conversion, right? That you bought it. You bought the idea, right? That you're convinced that that section of Acts, or I believe it's Acts, you correct me, where baptizing in the name of Jesus is the preferred formula. Right. And that the other, the other formula is erroneous or whatever you want to call it. That's a theological question that they can discuss amongst themselves, right? But for <laughs> yeah. But for us... Um, this baptism section, you know, that they're baptizing people in, con see, these are farm workers. Mm -hmm. These, they work backbreaking jobs. They're out there. They're, they're in danger constantly, not only from the elements, but from the law and from farm workers and from agribusiness. Right. And it's, it's, it's a backbreaking, awful job, but it's something that they've done for decades. Right. Mm -hmm. Carrie McWilliams, there's the factories in the field. Right. This is what it is. OK, so these baptisms take place in canals, in irrigation ditches, in these small bodies of water, which I could not believe. Right. Um, yeah. This was tough reading. I'll be honest with you, because I'm thinking they're getting dipped in pesticide. Right. Yeah. Which is you know, cancerous, awful pesticide. They're getting dipped uh, in like the ick factor was intense. Right. Like the sheer grossness of like, oh, that that water is not clean. That's what I, it's, mm -hmm. it's right. Um, and I couldn't help but think about the salvific effect, right, of water, right, mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, other traditions, from from other world religions, from Hinduism, the bathing in the Ganges, right, mm -hmm. to, to, to for salvation, for a positive rebirth, uh, for the washing away of sin. Right mm -hmm. to Mother Ganja, right, that 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 the, the, the gods and goddesses would help them. And I couldn't help thinking. Of course, in a Pentecostal context, because they would never, <laughs> they would never equate their baptism with baptize, with dunking yourself in the Ganges River. Right. Um, <laughs> and so we want to be clear. That's not we're. I'm putting those words in their mouths. They would never say that. Okay. Um, but tell us about those pictures and those histories when you when you write about them. What did you feel? Just the first visceral reaction of these baptisms. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Arlene. I mean, oh goodness. They, they were quite moving, um, especially someone I, I knew California history by then. I knew the really fraught history of, you know, uh, water rights in California and the context of, as you said, it's, it's the punishing world of of agribusiness, right? The factories in the fields. This is before the reforms brought about by by the UFW, or United Farm Workers. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of agriculture at its worst, if you will. Um, you know, it all came together for me, Arlene, when I... In one of my one of the early uh, interviews I conducted, so the man was Aniceto Ortiz, and I do capture his story in the book. And he tells me about he was baptized. Um, so today, if you know California, you go up Interstate Five, and That's right. yeah, Interstate Five, and you know by, by the time you're in the Modesto uh, area, of Patterson, really, um, you're, you're basically along the western side of the Golden Hills, right along the foothills. Yeah. 
Yeah. And he says, "Why well, I got baptized, he goes, the, it was long before the five was there, but I got baptized in um, basically a little pool, a ditch or a kind of a trough, if you will. Yeah. And he said, the preacher had to wait until it rained so that the pool would fill up and then they would take us there to get baptized. And when I saw how they were in tune with the cycles, right, waiting for the water to come, and very pragmatic about that. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't help but to see these pictures of these baptisms in the rivers, in the canals, and stories about being baptized as something really, really significant. I mean, they have photographs of you know, their baptisms in these canals. And this is a kind of space that most people would probably not want to be caught, uh, you know, swimming or or being around and many yeah, places no. you know trespassing prohibited so yes, they exactly. took they made these really profane spaces sacred yeah that's it's amazing it's amazing and and uh let's tra- backtrack a little bit uh thank you again for joining me we are talking to lloyd barba professor of religion and core faculty of latinx and latin american studies at amherst college and his new book is sewing the sacred mexican pentecostal farm workers in california published by Oxford University Press. And correct me on the dates. We're talking about 19, what are, what are the dates that your book covers? Primarily, I'm looking at a 50-year period from 1916 to 1966. There's a little bit of prehistory to that, but yeah, I stop at 66. Um, okay. That's 50 right. years of denomination and a lot of things change in the mid-60s. So it was a good- They do. A good that's a totally stop. different book. That's a totally right. different book, right? But you're capturing kind of the nascent stages of- mm-hmm of the movement coming out of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, thank thank you. Thank you for staying away from the the blowing up the Azusa Street thing, because we could just talk about that forever. You mention it and then you move on. I said, good for right. you, Lloyd. Good. <laughs> for anybody who knows that, I have a, a bone to pick. Uh, yes. With other folks who, who just load Azusa Street with so much freight, so much weight, so much. I don't think it can stand the amount of, I guess, salvific effect that Azusa Street has affected for over a century now. But anyway, yeah. that's beside the point. All right. So tell me more about these places, Lloyd. I was just struck by this, right? That that they're carving out uh, na- out of natural spaces because they don't have a lot of money, right? Mm-hmm. They're carving out spaces to worship. There was a thing called the pit, right? That they're, that they're worshiping in this right. area. There are carpas, which I understand are tents, mm-hmm. right? And the, the little thing you have in there about circus, and this is where it comes from. That's brilliant. Can I just say that? That's just like, that's just American Studies 101. You know what I mean? It's like find other other examples and kind of bring that in there because that's important. It's great stuff. Great stuff. So the temples, the architecture, I mean, they're basically carving out their religious life in the landscape, right? A very unforgiving landscape that mm-hmm. for them, they make theirs because it's not theirs, right? They work it. But mm-hmm. they are not part of it, you know what I mean? Because of race, because of illegality, quote unquote, because of a lot of things, right? Oh, so tell sure. us, tell us about the the landscape that you found when you were doing this research. Yeah, thanks, Arlene. Very kind words. Um, again, I'll, I'll remind you that I am a PhD in American Studies, right? So oh, I, I ask some good questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, one of the stories that stood out to me, and I start chapter three with this story. Yeah. Um, is the pit church that you talked about. So this is in Singer, um, east of Fresno. Uh, okay. It's a small Central Valley town. Uh, okay. And the story that stood out to me was told uh, to me by, uh, her name is Jeannie Manzano. Uh, she she passed away um, a, a few years back. But she told me the story about her father. So her father, Felipe Zuniga, uh, was caught up in the uh, repatriation of Mexicans uh, in the late 1920s, early 1930s. So he repatriated with his family to Mexico, came back after some really awful hardships, came back to the U.S. Um, you know, ag- against uh, the, 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 re- the wave of repatriation, uh, gets converted in El Paso, ends up in Singer. While his family, he and his family were making their way back to the U.S., someone on a train uh, instructed him on how to make adobe bricks. <laughs> so he took this talent and again, still engaged in farm work. Yeah. Um, the church in Sanger had been there for not long at all, just a couple of years. And they got to the point where they had this tent, Scarpa, 
where the karpa started to deteriorate. It, it, I mean, it's, these tents, Arlene, are supposed to be used for a couple of weeks, you know, uh, and they're using them for years. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, the karpa yeah. begins to deteriorate, and so they have to build a church. And so they, the workers in the church, of course, while the women are providing food and tamales and so on. We'll uh, talk about they, that later. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. They take out this huge hole in the ground. It's amazing. It's and, amazing. Uh, the tractors, when they would come by, they would call them topos or gophers because as they worship with the, with you know the tarp over it, it would start to billow. And you know how ecstatic and demonstrative Pentecostal church services can be. Oh yes. So it was oh, loud. Yes. People were moving. The, the tents billowing around, or uh, or the the, uh, the the tarp is, is billowing around. Yeah. And so little by little, he led the construction of this church. What mm -hmm. I find fascinating is the timing, right? The context is during the repatriation. He himself had come back after being repatriated and using U.S. soil. Yeah. On U.S. soil. That's built really a something. Permanent structure that still stands today as an apostolic church in Singer. And I just, that's the kind of stuff, again, as I'm being told these stories, I'm thinking in context and like, wow, this, yeah. this is really quite uh, phenomenal. And that is some it just hit me right that permanent structures right mm -hmm. that you, it's you're not going to be able to take those things down right not right. not not without a fight right that they're exactly. that they're forcibly claiming land that they're only supposed to be tenant farmers if you will working on right they get meager mm -hmm. wages they don't even get a piece of the land they essentially if they're lucky they get a small place to to live while they're working mm -hmm. and then once the crops dry out they got to move Right. They got to go do the right. sugar beet trail. Right. They got to go up to the Midwest. That's where my family went up. They went up to the Midwest to do the, the sugar beet trail in Michigan. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fascinating. Right. That they're uh, maybe subconsciously. Right. Working on retaking part of this land back. Right. Do it. Right. That, that little section you have about race. Tijerina, right. The oh, whole my. idea that, yeah. that there's land, you know, that this land is mine. <laughs> All right? right. And I have every right to build on it. Right. Even though that's not the, the section of the book does not deal with that. But it was fascinating. Right. So thank you for that. All right. So how do we get these books, these this great literature? Right. This is this awesome history, because, as you know, and this has been a a, 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 com, a complaint that those of us, the 400 of us who, who know a lot about this field, uh, that we want our stuff in the mainstream of American religious history. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's never done that way. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's a side note. It's a, it's a unit in somebody's seminar class. It's a, a book that's designed maybe for doctoral research. Um, undergrads maybe get a sliver, maybe a chapter here and there, uh, but, but right. then it's gone. Right. And then we go back to the staples and the standards of American religious history, the, the Alstrom and, and, uh, Gosted and then the readers mm -hmm. and all, you know, for those on the inside, you know what I'm talking about. Outsiders, all I can tell you is that there's a field called American religious history, and we have been fighting for about 40, 50 years to just to bang our way in into it and say, <laughs> you know what? We've been here forever and stop treating us like we just showed up. Okay. So I'm thinking this, and then you you can you respond. Okay. I'm thinking maybe we do what Brother Malcolm said. Right. And I'm wearing my Malcolm glasses, as I always do. I'm thinking maybe we just separate. Right. Maybe we don't need to be in the mainstream. Maybe we don't need to have our book center. I mean, of course, we want people to buy our books, but maybe we don't need that. Right. Maybe we're good by our by ourselves for us, by us. Right. FUBU. Mm -hmm. Right. They were, oh, yes. What, so what do you think about that? I mean, on the one hand, again, there's ways in which that that works as a strategy. Um, I think it's also important for us just to say, full stop, Latinx religion is a field, Latino religion, however you want to frame it, right? We are That's a right. field. Yes. We're not a subfield. We're not we, a subfield. That's exactly right. We compromise a bona fide field of study. Yes. So I think that's important for us to, to begin with there. Um, I mean, as, as far as, you know, the inequities in knowledge production goes, I mean, in writing this book, I had to read some of the main texts, right, on Pentecostal history. Of course. Right. Yeah. Now, I would only hope, and I have my fingers crossed, that, you know, some of the historians who, who've who written some of these landmark texts, whether we're talking Pentecostal history, we're talking, you know, Chicano history. Yeah. That they would read the kind of work that we're putting out. So often for folks in religion, oh, we're doing Latinx religion. For folks in, in Latinx studies, 
we're doing religion. So it's kind of, yeah, goodness, we kind of get the short end of the stick on a few different we occasions. We do, we do. We're like the unwanted child, right? We're like, oh, we don't belong anywhere. We're just, we're the middle child, right? We're like, we don't belong in the big, big field of Chicano history for a lot of reasons, right? Even though you use a lot of Chicano historians in mm -hmm. your work, which is very interesting. I'll, I'll mention that. I'll give you a little side note in a minute. And then American religion, right? We don't fit in there either. So we're just kind of stuck in this little field, right? right? But it is a field. It is a legitimate field of study. And, you know, we can only hope, right? Right. And by the way, you're. I think with this book, you're, you're now part of the second generation, right? I probably claim that. I oh probably my claim. God. I'm second so I'm gen. Like, I'm like your Nina. In many ways. Right? I'm like your <laughs> Nina. I'm like your, God, I'm like your godmother, right? It's like, I'm <laughs> Nina Arlene. It's like I remember reading that book when I was when I was in an undergrad. It's like, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> when my birthday comes around, I'll be sure to hit you up for some gifts. <laughs> oh man, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, let me tell you this quick story. Uh, I emailed Vicky Ruiz last night mm -hmm. to tell her about all kinds of things. She's my mentor, oracle friend, anything. You know, she's she's like my Dan Ramirez, yeah. right? I I just run stuff by her all the time. And I said, by the way, just and she's retired. She's been retired about five years. She is uh, the preeminent Chicano historian in the United States. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I use her work like, extensively, too. Yeah, in the you book. do. You do. Yeah. And I told her that. I said, by the way, this is a, this is a really sharp young scholar uh, who got his Ph.D. from Michigan. Uh, uh, he's at Armhurst now. And she, he used your work extensively. Um, and I just thought you'd know that. And she was thrilled. She was mm. thrilled. She said, what a nice thing. I look forward to reading it because your, your stuff is right up her alley. As you know, labor history, Chicano women, Chicano labor history. Uh, I'm just thrilled that you were able to meld all of these disparate voices. Mario Barrera, Vicky Ruiz, uh, Deborah Weber, all of these folks together and go, wow, that's that mm -hmm. it can see. That's the thing. What you did is you said it can work together. They yeah. do not need to be segregated, separate fields. Right? right. So you kind of. You answered my question of like, do we need to be separate or not? You did it with your own book saying, I don't care what people say. I'm just going to do everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I'm not I'm not going to really pay attention to these labels. I'm like, no, that's just straight up history. You can't use that. That's sociology. You can't use that. Yes, you can. Because Latino religion is interdisciplinary by nature. Right. I, by, I its, by its very existence, it has to incorporate all this stuff. So just so you know, Vicky is thinking about you. <laughs> oh, wonderful. That that's that's great to know. And I mean, if you read the the introduction, that's exactly what I'm doing, right? I'm trying to get folks in Pentecostal history to understand what Chicano history is. Chicano exactly. history folks to see themselves within the context, solidly in the context of American uh history of the American West. That's right. And borderlands folks to also catch up to speed and say, hey, this stuff on material religion is very exciting. Look at photographs. So Again, the intro is maybe a bit long, but I do see myself as, you know, situated in or at the crossroads of these many yeah, different Yeah, you're sitting fields. right there. You're sitting right there at that crossroads. You might be very lonely, but you're right there. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to wait for other people to catch up, I think. Oh, the, those roads in the West, Arlene, they're all lonely roads, right? <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. Uh, my family, they they came from Texas. They moved to California. They did the migrant trail up to, to Corcoran. Corcoran. And Corcoran. Yes. Right. And they they pick cotton. That makes they sense. Cotton. Corcoran, yeah. And and they and then they moved into past beyond your point. We're talking about your book, but they moved into those secondary fields, you know, mm -hmm. uh, auto, yep. uh, auto work, uh, prisons, sadly, you know, because the prison industrial complex is very, very big in central and northern California. So they oh, they, yeah. they worked at Corcoran prison uh, because anything to get out of the fields. Mm -hmm. Right. And and that's the thing. Right. Is that I'm sure they'll all tell you as much as they tried to sacralize everything. Boy, anything to get out of those fields. Right. Right. Because it's it's uh, unending. Dredgery <laughs> is, it, the, it is, is the word that comes to mind, you know. Yeah. Again, okay. and this is pre UFW reforms in the you know oh, exactly. the period I study. So yeah, it's... no, no. See, and... that's what I let, let the audience know that that this is before Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta. Um, all of those folks who put this together, uh, the grassroots folks, this is before any reform. This this was when they had to do the short hoe mm -hmm. and uh, they had to pick the strawberries. I mean, people love strawberries, but if people knew how much awful labor it takes to pick a strawberry, I mean, your your description of that was intense. It was like, whoa, I'm gonna, never going to buy another one again. <laughs> 
Tell us the, a little my, about that. Yeah, when uh, Jeannie Manzano, she told yeah. me that uh, uh, some of her siblings, because they had worked in the strawberry field so long, couldn't even stand looking at strawberries anymore. They couldn't eat strawberries. <laughs> and it, it was on a Driscoll strawberry farm in um, just outside of Modesto. Right. In, in right, Escalon. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's right. That, that, those are great. Those are, that was a great piece of work right there. I am talking to Dr. Lloyd Barba, who is Assistant Professor of Religion and Core Faculty of Latinx Latin American Studies at Amherst College in his new book, which you must get, even though it is sold out now, get it on back order or download it digitally today, called Sewing the Sacred Mexican Pentecostal Farm Workers in California, published by Oxford University Press. Okay, so this has been a love fest so far. Let me do a little pushback just for those three people thinking, you're not even being critical. What's wrong with you? Okay, so here it is. Women in Pentecostalism, very complicated history. I'm speaking for myself now. Those of us, me in particular, uh, maybe you, I don't want to speak for you, who study women in what is fairly obviously conservative religious traditions. And Pentecostalism is a conservative religious tradition. I believe mm -hmm. Latinx Pentecostalism, if I would say, is even more conservative. <laughs> right? I think so. I think yeah. it's, it's, got a, it's got an extra layer of oh, yeah. stuff going on there. Okay. So they had, I had very complex feelings about how to tell their stories. Okay. Because when we disagree with them, what do we do? We have to let them tell their stories. Otherwise, we're limiting their agency. So I understand that. But these women in, in the church that you study, the Apostolic Assembly, they cannot be ordained. Uh, their bodies are regulated through a very high tension piety that has created kind of what I would call a worn purity culture. They wear it on their bodies, mm. right? Um, every day through work, through leisure, they can't get away from it. Um, they don't cut their hair. Am I right? They wear dresses. They usually cover their arms. They don't wear makeup. Uh, and in the book, you talk about penalties for women who did not dress this way. Uh, even though they contributed tremendously to the building of these churches. And we'll talk about that in a minute with the sale of tamales and women's work and, and that whole idea that women are not producing. So I'm not going there. I'm not going with the kind of North American feminist critique that says they need to be pastors. They need to be in the center of power. No, as I wrote in my first book, I think they can be just as helpful in peripheral power centers, if mm -hmm. that's such a thing. But mm -hmm. maybe the center core of power of the the pastorate is not for them, right? Maybe it is a legitimate theological certainty that they have with them and we have to give them, we have to respect that decision that they've made. So so how do you deal with that, Lloyd? I mean, it's it's hard for me. I'll be honest. It's hard for me to see uh, women in these churches and not feel, and I don't want to feel sorry for them. That's the wrong word. Right. I, I really kind of strain to understand that that life that this kind of worn purity, uh, particularly mm -hmm. with these dress codes. So tell me about that. I mean, if one is straining to understand, I think you're approaching it right, because there is a certain extent to which you're not going to get pushback when you discuss this, as it's uh, one of the movement's key identity markers. It's really a sacrosanct kind of topic. Not that we can't discuss it, but there's always exceptions or folks, you know, researchers just don't quite get it for whatever reason. It's one of those things where you have to live it to really understand it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's always um, a point of defense that holds uh, uh, scholars at bay. Uh, I, I would agree, Darlene. I think oh, not just among uh, Latina Pentecostals, but especially oneness Pentecostals, they've held on to the yes. modesty dress codes or what they call yes. holiness standards much yes. longer than their counterparts in the Assemblies of God, the Church of God in Christ, the Churches of God, much longer than any of those churches have. That's right. Why do you so, think that is? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so. I think part of it is there is a deep understanding among them that they are a restoration of the first century church. Okay, so in this kind of imagined history what the first century church looked like, they take uh, Pauline commandments. Uh, I don't want to say they take them literally, but I think they, they apply them in ways that they imagine that they're literal. Uh, and they take those as quite seriously. I think there's also a point of departure somewhere in the 60s and the 70s, yes. whereas we see some of their Trinitarian counterparts who uh, begin to relent somewhat on, on holding up these uh, holiness standards. Yes. Uh, among the oneness uh, counterparts, they don't do that. Now, this doesn't necessarily pertain to all of them, but uh, this is also 
in some ways an extreme kind of um pushback against feminism right or the feminist movement or... i think it is i think it is i think it's it's an outward display of resistance mm-hmm. You know, and so I think yeah. what you do, what is genius about your book, and I'm, of course, I'm setting you up, right? Really, it really is, is that you use this, this terminology, schismatic, heterodox, resistance, and you kind of turn it on its head. Because normally those words are appropriated by, by North American progressives to mm-hmm. suggest something else, yeah. right? And usually they don't. Uh, again, as uh, as Martin warned us, right? Be careful of liberals, right? Because they're they're not always your friend. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but no, right? I mean, that's that's what he said. Um, but that's what I'm thinking is that that this is an active form of resistance, right? And of course, white progressive or even Latinx progressive folks would not see it that way. They would see it as oppressive, as um, as nothing that they would ever entertain as liberative okay? right but you turn that on its head and you say this is resistance building these churches is resistance wearing this making the tamales it's resistance right so tell mm-hmm. us about that yeah and to situate that a little bit more so we're thinking again in the context of one of pentecostals who yeah. already cut ties with the trinitarian counterparts over the doctrine of the trinity yeah so they're like in resistance mode basically for much of their existence You've not been baptized in Jesus' name? Come, we'll rebaptize you. And if you don't get baptized, I mean, a large number of them really go as far as to say you're not part of the body of Christ. Oh, yeah. So I think they're used to uh, being, uh, you know, on the margins of mainstream, yeah. on the margins of American religion. So upholding this, uh, holding the stress standards, I think, becomes another way of actually just maintaining that point of difference. So, I mean, one of the refrains you'll see over and over in the literature is, um, this kind of idea of being in the world but not being of the world, taken from First John. Oh yeah, that that I mean that that really tracks. Uh, so it's more than a bumper sticker. Is that what you're telling me, Lloyd? It's more than a bumper sticker that I I see on trucks with the Trump flag <laughs> and the thing. Don't don't tell oh, me that. This is don't all tell pre, me that. This is pre-Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, I'm just saying I, that's yeah. the, that's where I've seen that. That was it. NTF or NTW. It's like oh, and there's a, there's a sword which is even worse. It's like a sword. Anyway, another topic another day. (laughs) Okay. These tamales that women, Mm -hmm. women are doing work, right? That they're, of course, by, by the, by the, by their accepted theology, they do not, or or those that have attempted to become pastors have usually had to find work outside of the mainstream, out of sight of their mainstream churches. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we understand that, that people, that women have left. Okay. But those who have stayed, because that's what your book is about. The women who stayed and created this, this marvelous kind of uh, agricultural, architectural pastiche of mm, things that are mm-hmm, theirs, mm-hmm. right? It's theirs. Like no one can take the agribusiness, not going to take it away. Uh, sp- was it Spreckles or whatever they're called? Not going to take it away. Mm. Driscoll's not going to take This is theirs, right? So they're making these tamales and you, and you write really, really beautifully about the arduous nature. I've made tamales. Have you made tamales, Lloyd? I have my grandma. So, so that, that's what I'm talking made about. Made the best tamales. So, so that's yeah. what I'm saying. People outside of this discussion, you you don't know work until you've had to make the tamales from scratch because it's intense, right? Right. So when you were reading that and writing about it, what did you, did it did it make you? Did it give you some memories? Did you get a little wistful? Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, for one, you basically have a recipe to make tamales in the book. In I one, know, which is fantastic. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So. This is a story, Arlene, that kept coming up over and over. Everyone I interviewed said, we funded our churches because of tamales. Like, well, who who made the tamales? And those women invariably. Of course. And that led me to this, um, to just forthrightly say in the book, to do a material history yeah. of Mexican Pentecostal farm workers is to do a women's history. There's no Excellent. way around it. That's right. Uh, and I mean, what you have to, what that requires is kind of decentering what we call like the logocentric history of like the preachers and the words and the text and so on to do material history, the nitty gritty stuff, the things people exactly. hold in their hands, the yep. things they regard with their eyes. That You're singing is, my song. You're singing my song, Lloyd. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. And that uh, in uh, I mean, among the interviewees in the, in the sources I was consulting, tamales just kept coming up over and over. Yeah. And yeah. 
to the point yeah. where, again, uh, you don't have these churches without tamales. And I wanted to make that point very clear. And I thought it deserved a good portion of what became chapter four, uh, the sacred talents, right? And that's one of the talents. They are right. genius fundraisers. That's right. They they really are, you know, because where else are you going to get money, right? Where else, right. You, you know, nobody's going to fund the the, the uh, classical Pentecost, the Trinitarian folks aren't going to give you money, mm -mm. right? Uh, the uh, Maybe the, the higher ups in the larger one denominations, like, well, if you join us, you know, if you right. lose your autonomy, we'll give you money. But it's like, no, we don't want to join you, right? What is it? The UPC, United Pentecostal Church, or PAW, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, predominantly African-American, and the latter is predominantly white. They don't want it, right? So this is a way, as I saw when I was reading it, to maintain autonomy, mm -hmm. right? So that we don't have to. We don't have to go to, you know, uh, Theo, someone, right? We don't have to go to the, We don't have to beg and ask for money. These are very proud people. It's it seemed like, people. right? They're very, Absolutely. very proud people. And like, like they're not going to take any, for lack of a better word, they're just not going to take any shit, right? It's like, they're going to, they're going to build and they're going to do oja by oja, right? Masa by masa, yeah. chile by chile, to wrap that thing up, steam it. And it takes hours. <laughs> it takes oh, hours. Yeah. And by the time you're done with like the fourth or fifth dozen, you're sick mm -hmm. of them. Right. You're tired of tasting them. You're, it's like, OK, we're, getting, we're set for Christmas. It's like, I don't want to see another one mm -hmm. uh, ever again because you're you're tired of looking at these things. But it's it was fascinating the way you made it come alive. It really was something. Thanks, Arlene. And again, this is routine activity. Um, chapter four begins right with, with yeah. this uh, exchange between Maria and Aniceto Ortiz. Maria says, tamales for the building of the church. Aniceto, todos los fines de semana. Maria, every weekend, Aniceto, every weekend, meet tamales. Again, I'm catching this up on the recorder, right? They're just going back and forth every weekend, every weekend. Oh, it was all day. Our weekends were taken up. So, again, there are folks who were laboring out in the field, and their break was fundraising for the churches. Yeah, it's it, yeah. women worked when they weren't sleeping. They worked, and you, you put it in the book very nicely. They worked in the fields. They came home. They worked again. Uh, they They basically took uh, uh, responsibility for rearing children and mm -hmm. helping the church. So yeah. women's work, it's an, it's an old adage, right? But the women's work was just never done. Right. Right. It was constant because again, like who would do this? Because a, a, a sense, right? And you could say this, it's a calling, right? It's a sense that they were building something very precious to them. That's the they only were. thing that could make, that's the only thing that I would think of that would make you stick this out this long. Right. right in the dress code matter of fact let's let's make that clear right you don't go out you you still wear your stuff mm -hmm. right it's hot you still wear your stuff right? right you're gonna have some leisure time there's a story in the book where there's like a leisure time and the girl goes out with a thing a bit too short and one one of the the uh, i don't know what they're called in that church but one of the older women tells her oh you need to cover that up right and i think she goes back and she changes or something like that it was really amazing Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I could put just uh, some kind of conceptual go. Uh, go ahead. Uh, footing to it. So this is where I worked one of uh, Vicky Ruse's ideas of the of double duty existence. In this case, I call it a triple duty existence because right. you're you're raising the family and you're working the double duty existence. On top of that, you're also evangelizing and you're fundraising for the church. It's all done in the name of evangelizing or winning souls, oh, yeah. right? To kind of use a yeah. Pentecostal parlance. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, yeah, this kind of work does not end. And yeah. also... I do refer to the uh, women farm workers as it might be somewhat of a strange term and folks might balk when they read it, but, but I said us because they are as much farm workers as anyone else. And to deny them that I think is just, a, it's a kind of erasure where again, right. the, the officially contracted Bracero workers, right? Officially contracted the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those were men, but a lot of them were at families. A number of them came through so repetitiously and yeah. they maintain families here. But I said, us are very much part of the story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we have a few minutes left. Hopefully you can stick with us for a couple Absolutely. more minutes. Left. Oh, Absolutely. I'm enjoying this, Arlene. Okay, great. I, th I, I thought you would. Because like, this is like an old conversation that we used to have. You know what I mean? This is one of those mm -hmm. things before COVID ruined everything. Right. <laughs> I am uh, talking to Dr. Lloyd Barbara, who's an assistant professor of religion and core faculty in Latinx and Latin American studies at Amherst College. His brand new book is called Sewing the Sacred, Mexican Pentecostal Farm Workers in California, published by Oxford University Press. Pick it up. Okay. 
the last section um, on sacred nostalgia. Okay, I want to make a case, and you may mm -hmm. disagree with me. I love All the right. term. Okay. Yeah. Uh, logic calls it the golden age fallacy, right? And we're mm -hmm. all susceptible to it. So it's yeah. not a negative. It's not a pejorative term. It's just a way, it's a psychological mechanism that people use to kind of make sense of the present chaos to hearken back to something in their mind that they perceive as pristine and pure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they the, the, the sacred nostalgia that you talk about, that they perceive something behind them past that was better before that people behaved that they went to church that they dressed appropriately that they didn't watch tv all of that stuff and i want to argue that that's true for almost all of our perceptions <laughs> about everything right like everything was better back then right everything was cheaper you could actually afford a house in california right massachusetts where you are now <laughs> i mean you could do that so i think but, but what you're talking about specifically, we could talk about nostalgia all day, right? Is this other kind of nostalgia um, where they see a particular point in their past uh, as pristine, right? And the urgency of getting back to it for a very specific reason, to gain more followers, to purge critics, and to recreate themselves in the form of what? The first century church, right? Mm -hmm. The apostles, the acts, the 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 remnants of the book of uh, reminiscent of the book of Acts, right through these photos, this music, this dress, the food. Okay, I think they're it's all part of this nostalgia factory, right? It's it, I don't know what to think about it, right? All all I can say is I see it over and over and over again. It's it's now a what's a good word for it? It's a trope, mm -hmm. right? It's a trope, and I think Pentecostal lore is what I want to say that there is a pristine moment back then. And I wrote about, I think I'm pretty sure I wrote about it in my book, the second book, uh, like where this is where it was perfect, where mm -hmm. everybody was obeying God. And if we go back there, the floodgates will open and we'll see everybody saved. Everybody will see the, 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 the necessity of holiness codes. Everybody will get rid of their TVs and life will be better, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that nostalgia is good. Or bad, and I don't know mm -hmm. if we want to give it value at all, but I want to talk about it for a few minutes to see what you have to say. Yeah, thanks, Arlene. Again, I think you're spot on, right? It's the golden age fallacy that one tends to romanticize the past in ways that it probably wasn't, you know, quite the case, right? It's not necessarily the reality. So I saw this in a couple of different ways among the interviewees. Um, three areas that really developed. So the sacred nostalgia I discussed is in three arenas. Uh, riffing off of Tom Tweed, his 1997 uh, anthology on retelling American religious history, right. I discussed the sound sights, S I G H T S, and sights, S I T E S. So, sounds is the idea that the music was different, that the music mm -hmm. was so much better back then, right? right? And if you want to read about the music, read Dan Ramirez's book, right? Uh, about the difference in music and how it meant uh, something to the uh, identity of, of the movement then. So, yeah, sounds, uh, hallelujah, the loud, the, the hallelujah, right? The loud uh, night services. They say it was different. We had different music then, and they would often turn to, to get back to our discussion about the holiness dress code, your modesty yeah. uh, standards. They would often say that women dress more modestly. Now, I get that as a general point about American society. I think that's, you know, that can be uh, taken on, on those terms. But I started thinking about, what is it that they're actually describing? So is see, you know, most of the time they were actually describing these uh, white dusters that they would wear. So these long, very uh, modest, yeah. and they covered almost head to toe, right? Very your face is revealed yeah. and your hands are revealed. Yeah. Um, they're describing those, but those were only really used for special services. And so I started to think the extent to which the photographs perhaps over-informed perceptions of the past and mm -hmm. informed the sacred nostalgia, so I said, oh, the women used to wear this, like they wore them for special services or wore them when they're part of the choir. That's why we have photographs of them, because it was a special service. So they wanted to commemorate that and they took photographs. But it's not something that they wore all the time. And that's, right. that's your benchmark of what holiness standards were back in the day. You're going to set a standard that is no pun intended on standard and set a standard that is too high to attain, um, right. you know, in, in modern day. So. Yeah, that I thought was uh, fascinating that a lot of them kept referring to the way that the women dressed. And that's literally the phrase they used, the way they used to dress. Yeah, 
Yeah. I don't, I don't, that's not surprising at all. It's not surprising mm -hmm. at all because I, I have found uh, that the, the golden age fallacy is deeply tied to morality. Oh yeah. Right. It's not tied to, boy, do you remember when we got a fair wage? <laughs> you remember when we got health care? You know, you remember, I mean, there is no doubt a nostalgia factory among mm -hmm. progressives who want to look at past gains and say, well, we got all this. Well, how come everything's not solved? How come everybody's not on the same page? I mean, how come people are still struggling and in poverty? Different discussion, different time, right? But but people latch on to nostalgia, mm -hmm. I think. And then the danger I see is if it's so tied to morality that it becomes oppressive, right? That it becomes mm -hmm. a thing of like, we need to get back to that. We need to get back to that because... Again, it's it's kind of a part of well, go way, way back, you know, when your studies and your reading of like this, the, the, the rise of evangelicalism and the Scottish Enlightenment and how it's all a method. It's a method. Right. So clicking this method, clicking this open, this this dress code open will the floodgates will be like yeah. people will come to church. People will get baptized in the Holy Spirit. People will be rebaptized. This nostalgia factory is the key to reopening this, what they view as this massive wave mm -hmm. of, of evangelism, right? And, right? and I think that that's why they stick so tightly to it, right? Because they believe it. They believe that it's a, it's a process and a method mm -hmm. that has served this substrata, uh, this largest substrata of American religion for generations, mm -hmm. right? The idea of removing all of the present uh, unholy immorality, blah, 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 right? And replacing it with this pristine moment when everything was good, right? I, I, I'm i beginning to think because our country is in the grip of nostalgia right now, and it's mm -hmm. not good. So maybe that's coloring my perceptions, right? That nostalgia is not a neutral word right now, where normally it's like, ah, oh, you know, you, 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 you're wistful for the days of when you were young. Everybody wishes that or whatever, okay? Right. I don't think so. I, I, I think presently we're grip, we're in the grip of a nostalgia that leads to some very dark stuff, right? So I'm wondering, right? I mean, if you, if you're looking at this chapter and you're thinking about it, how? I mean, do you ever view a point where this nostalgia can become dangerous? Yeah. So I think the problem with nostalgia is often that it is uh, decontextualized. So the context doesn't matter. It's the practice that matters. They did this because it was moral for some reason. Again, with no respect to what was going on. What were the uh, the conditions that gave rise for this kind of yeah. uh, behavior, these kinds of norms? And so long as you try to lift that up from its context and apply it today, I think that's where it can get dangerous. Um, and you can slip into things like, you know, we just talked about Ray Slippus D. Hitting that, right? Yep. He's an example, Arlene, where he he takes holiness standards even too far for one as holiness Pentecostal folk. I know. That was he an amazing. People, for the listeners, yeah. do a real quick recap of who Mr. T. Hitting was. Yeah, so Reyes Lopez de Herina, who is sometimes referred to as uh, the uh, one of the four horsemen of the Chicano apocalypse. <laughs> one of my favorite terms, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so one of those four horsemen of the uh, Chicano apocalypse, um, which, again, if you know de Herina, that's a wonderfully apropos term, uh, given his uh, perception about the end times. So he led a struggle in the Southwest to restore lands to Mexican mm -hmm. families who had been cheated out of these lands in the 19th century. Uh he led this armed struggle uh, to overtake the Tierra Amarilla courthouse in 1967. Yeah. Uh, that was a whole decade. Or so uh, maybe a whole decade before that, he was an itinerant Pentecostal preacher, which yeah. Rudy Busto and, has tracked so well. And uh, yeah, Lorena yeah. Orofeza has also done good work. That's with. right. And I, I'm reviewing a book right now called Mexican Moses. Oh, um, by Ramon Ramon Gutierrez Gutierrez. yeah. Uh, and it's just fascinating. It's like he's dug deep and not that the mm -hmm. other two didn't, but he's digging deep in a different way. And he's really mm -hmm. exploring the religion as angle uh, a uh, lot, a lot. And so he's doing that. He's work. And so I'm interested. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I'm interested in where maybe your work and his work will overlap, uh, whether there'll be a lot of excavation of the oneness Pentecostal uh, work that he did. And eventually he left, right? He didn't stay that long, if I remember correctly. He wasn't a, he wasn't a longtime follower of the Apostolic Assembly. Is that correct? Well, 
yeah, so he was with the Assemblies of God, and then he had gone to one of the Bible schools in Texas. He preached this, one of the things that document, he preached a two-week revival that, you know, That's the right. preacher That's ran right. out of town because he was saying men should have long beards like Jesus, men should wear long tunics, uh, yeah. and, you know, he reluctantly uh, donned a tie when he <laughs> preached. He said, this is a worldly thing. Why would I want to wear a tie? So, Arlene, right. one of the wildest things, an early interview, I'll, I'll just share a little nugget with Go you ahead. I have Go to ahead. share. It didn't make it into the book. Uh, go ahead. But, I love that stuff. Yeah. So uh, I was uh, speaking uh, to uh, Jeannie Manzano's husband, mm -hmm. um, who was not in great health. Let's put it that way at the no. time. So I didn't have an official interview with him. But he gave me this little nugget that just led me on this paper trail and oral. The best. It, Those are the I best. I ended up, because of what he told me, I'll tell you right now, I ended yeah. up at the University of New Mexico and their archives and doing an oral history in Coral Gables. He told me, a long time ago, this Chicano radical came to some of our churches and took people from the Salinas church out into the desert. Now you can imagine, right? My yes. face is just lighting up when he's telling yes. me I'm making all the connections. I said, yeah. by chance was it Tijerina? He goes, Tijerina, now that was the guy. I said, any names you can give me of folks who knew about this. And I ended oh, yeah. up doing interviews on it. And it was just a story to be excavated. Great. Yeah, no, he is an amazing preacher, an amazing story, uh, and whatever you think of where he ended up, right? It's it's a, it's a biography that anyone who knows anything about American religious history needs to know. Oh yeah. Let's just put it that way, right? Okay, um, what is the future of US Latinx Pentecostalism? That's a big thing, but I always leave it open-ended, right? Are you gonna be doing work in this field again? Um, where do you see it going? I mean, I, I don't know if you've gotten questions yet, but I get questions almost weekly about like, where's it going? What can you tell me? How is it, you know? And beyond, they've thankfully moved beyond how can people are converting? Because right. like, I'm tired of that question. But the second, like, where are they going now, right? I mean, they seem to be sticking around. It's no joke, they've been around for over hundred years. They're sticking around, right? This is a legitimate movement and they're a separate identity from anything they were before, right? It's obvious that they've set, set themselves with a different identity, with a different process of creating identity, of recreating it. Mm -hmm. than whatever they were before, Catholic or nothing or whatever. But what's the future? What do you see coming, um, if not for this group that you studied, maybe for the long run? Where do mm -hmm. you see it going? Yeah, so for the group that I studied, I mean, after the 1960s, moving into the 70s and the final uh, decades of the century, they are no longer the substratum, right? They are, when we look at Latino Pentecostals in the U.S., they are one of the most, one of the largest, most formidable groups for sure. So they're also encountering a lot more competition in the religious marketplace, if you want to use that metaphor. I love that metaphor. So, yeah, this is something I, uh, I, I documented uh, not too long ago in uh, an essay I wrote on Latino Pentecostalism for the Oxford Handbook on Latinx okay. Christianities. Right. That's uh, edited by Christy Nabin Warren. So post 1965, right? So in 1965, we have the Heart Cell Immigration Act, and that takes effect in a couple, uh, couple years after that. Yeah. Um, you have this denomination I study that is very self-conscious about its 50-year mark in 1966. Moving into the 70s and the 80s, you have, I mean, these uh, churches from the global south sending missionaries right. and send, and right. their own are coming. Luz yep. del Mundo out of Guadalajara, the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God based out of Brazil, Elim based out of El Salvador. Yep. And they are providing stiff competition, especially in the urban centers. Yes. So if you go see a Latino storefront, Pente or, uh, uh, Latino uh, storefront church, that is a Pentecostal church, chances are they're probably not assemblies of God. And they're probably not even apostolic assembly, even those or church of God. And I think those three are the largest yeah. Uh, yeah. numerically in terms of number of churches Correct. and members. It's probably an independent church or it has some kind of loose connection to uh, Guatemala or El Salvador is yeah. or Mexico. So yeah, uh the future, it is interesting. Is, We're mm -hmm. seeing like many tributaries, right? We're seeing oh, yeah. kind of the, the transnational, the binational mm -hmm. effect of the global south from the southern cone, even yeah, uh, bringing bringing churches up into the United States and evangelizing because that's what they do, right? They're going to compete, right? right. And that's it's winning souls, right? It's all about that. So it's like that they're going to compete, and then you have this this the staple old guard over 100 year kind of and and many would say ossified denominations 
right? They're like, we have a structure, we have a way of doing things, we have intendants, superintendents, bishops, small, you know, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they've formed themselves into a, a complete institution by this yeah. point. And so if you're not, if you're not looking for that, you might look at one of those storefronts. Right. Say, hey, I don't, I don't want those big churches. I don't want, cause that I come from that. I'm not interested in that. Right. right. I like you. I like, I like a pastor who works. Mm -hmm. Right. I like a, a church that where you set up and tear down, you go eat after. Right. Yeah. I like that. I don't I don't want to be getting lost. Right. In this big, gigantic vacuum of the mega church or the non-denominational church. Right. And also, too. And I'm sure you you capture this, the, the, the importance of the culture of maintaining right. culture, of maintaining a language of maintaining kinship ties. Uh, uh, Latinos have been subjected to the assimilation machine for centuries. Right. And it's like, yeah, this religious movement is a way to resist, to use your word, to resist, uh, to, to be submerged, to be schismatic, but to be themselves. Right. I think our lean immigration is going to be a, a testing point because yeah. immigration is going to continue. Right. It is. Uh, it's not going away. Right. And I think the way that churches respond to immigration yeah. in their political stances or social mm -hmm. doctrine, that's going to matter quite a bit, I think, in these uh, coming years, because absent uh, immigration, we're talking about decline in a lot of churches across the U.S., including Pentecostal churches, uh, oh, evangelical yeah. churches, right? We know evangelical churches from multiple studies uh, that they're in decline numerically, absent, uh, yeah. especially Asian and uh, Latin American immigration. Absolutely. Without without question. And that, that's been true for about five to 10 years. And it's... Uh... It's always one of those things like, oh, wow, really? What do we do about it? And then politically, many of them choose to kind of be buffet against immigration as if it's it's just happened right now. Again, it's that nostalgia thing. Like, why is this happening right now? It's like it happens oh. perpetually all the time, every year for 200 plus years. Right. I mean, it happens all the time, you know, but it's a very effective tool. It's a very effective rhetorical tool to suggest that there's newness, uh -huh. that this has never been done before, and that this is somehow a different problem. That past immigration was okay, but new immigration, that's like our limit. Like, we can't do this anymore. It's like, it's, right. it's, a, it's a bizarre thing. But again, rhetorically, uh, if we could figure out how to break that rhetorical stranglehold, we'd be millionaires, but we're not. And we don't know how, right? So we're just meager little, you know, uh, academics working in our libraries trying to figure out how to how to produce this knowledge for people, right? It's it's a tough problem, the whole thing of immigration and how it's it's been weaponized. Right. You know? I mean, yeah. sewing the sacred is a story about immigration. You do not have this story without immigration, and I can't help but to wonder um, how that care for the sojourner will be carried into the future. That's that's something we have yet to find and the extent to which, to borrow a polling metaphor, they'll be uh, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of political doctrine, to <laughs> put a twist on it. Uh, yeah, you, we'll you, just put have to that, see. you put that in your book, you, that your epigram, am I right? Not not the Pauline thing, but you, you dedicated it to those folks. Am I correct? Oh, um, yes. I'll, I'll read the, the dedication. Yeah, read it. And I think that's a good way for us to end out. So go ahead and read that for us, will you? Excellent. We'll do. Great, great suggestion, Arlene. Yeah, when, when he works on that, let me remind you, we have been uh, podcasting here, a uh, very, very kind gentleman, Greg Soden. I'm the guest host of Classical Ideas Podcast. My name is Arlene Sanchez-Walsh, and I've been having a delightful conversation with Dr. Lloyd Barba, who is Assistant Professor of Religion and on the core faculty of Latinx and Latin American Studies at Amherst College. And he's going to read a brief uh, beginning of his book because it's fantastic. It's called Sewing the Sacred, Mexican Pentecostal Farm Workers in California. Go out and get it, download it, Oxford University Press. All right, here's a dedication. Sewing the Sacred is dedicated to the farm workers who have broken their bodies, atoning for the nation's sin of starvation. I think that's the best way to end it. Thank you so much, Lloyd. I appreciate it. I hope you will enjoy uh, the coming cold winters in Massachusetts. We will be uh, sending you pictures of sun from here in Southern California. Wonderful, it'll warm up my phone at the very least. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Yeah, you're welcome.